ago, a paper was published in the Journal of Theoretical Biology, um, finding, claiming that um, more beautiful parents were more likely to have girl babies. Um, and the, the actually, they, they estimated that um, the, from the, they found some data where the more attractive parents were eight percentage points more likely to have girls than, than others, which was reported in Freakonomics as uh, more attractive paid parents are 36 percent more likely to have girls, which was false, um, and then trumpeted as a you know delightfully politically correct finding, incorrect politically incorrect finding. Um, <clears throat> it was. Uh, from a statistical point of view, there are two problems with it, this claim, which I do not believe. Um, so the first is that there is tons of literature on sex ratios, and it, um, basically nothing predicts sex ratio varying by more than a half a percentage point. Even huge differences uh, comparing different points in the population can get smaller differences than that. Um, given that uh, the attractiveness measure itself was measured with error, I'll tell you that, about that in a moment, um, you would expect any effect to be, if anything, less than 0.1 percentage point. Uh, this was a study done with 3,000 people, which is pretty big for a psychology study or a medical study. Um, 3,000, that's a lot. Like when we do public opinion polls, They'll do a survey of 1,500, and the margin of the standard error of the estimate is maybe 1.5%. So 3,000 sounds pretty good. On the other hand, if you want to estimate something within a precision of 0.1%, you'll need something more like 300,000 people. So statistically, it's what we call a dead on arrival study. However, the result was statistically significant, which puts us in forensic territory. I mean, we can just be straight Bayesian and say, well, this is my prior and it's not a lot of evidence, but forensically, how did they find statistical significance? A little thing called the garden of forking paths. There are a lot of ways of looking at the data. In fact, one way you can often see this is look at what we call the multiverse, which is kind of a combination of statistics and historical analysis. So when historians try to study what could have happened had the world been different, they don't say, a serious historian does not say, oh, what would happen if this, what would have occurred if this had happened or that had happened? They look in historical documents and they'll say, what would happen if certain decisions had been made? And if a decision was actually being considered by, by some group, um, then they would, would you not look at your phone while I'm talking? It's so distracting to me. Um, okay. And so, all, all, all um, laptops shut down. When, um, shut, shut. If you don't like Stop them. talking. I want to continue. Okay. Um, <coughs> so we can look, and actually we can look at other papers by the same researcher on the same topic and notice that he studied it in different comparisons in different papers. It's very clear that there are four and paths. No surprise that you can get statistical significance by looking a lot at your data in many different ways. Um, so, but I want to get to a couple of interesting aspects of this. Um, first, is that this was a clever study. Actually, it was it was all data. It was something called the Adolescent Health Survey, which it was a survey of health behavior of adolescents. One thing that they did in that survey was the survey, the, 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 per, the survey interviewers surreptitiously marked the attractiveness of the participants of the people, which is not so unreasonable if you're studying risk behavior. It was longitudinal. They followed them up. Some of them had kids. They looked at the sex of their first child. Like, so I'm saying this because although it was it's a bad study, it was a bad paper, ultimately I, I, ultimately I hold it against the author not for making the mistake, but for having seen criticism and, and, and not accepting it. Just I think what people do is they drive around the criticism, like, oh, you did p-hacking. No, I didn't. Uh, you, this study had never had a chance because statistical, I'm not going to look at that, right? So they, they go around and keep claiming it. And I find that annoying. That's kind of a, a moral issue, like where, you know, is uh, ignorance, is ignorance a defense? Uh, there's a saying called Clark's Law, which is any sufficiently incompetent um, analysis is um, indistinguishable from fraud, like things like that. I'm not going to go there too much now. I also want to point out um, something that um, we call the one-way street fallacy, 
which is someone finds a study like this. It's like, well, I don't know whether to believe it. So you end up pulling, getting pulled halfway, right? It's like kind of a Bayesian reasoning. I don't think there's any connection between attractiveness and sex ratio. They find this. So I guess some compromise, like maybe there's something. But you can't do that, because maybe there's something in the other direction, too. They had a whole theory for why an evolution is the journal of theoretical biology. They had a whole theory for why beautiful parents were more likely to have girls, which had to do with the idea that being pretty under their schoolyard evolutionary biology theories, that being pretty is better for girls and for boys, and uh, attractiveness runs in families, and so it's evolutionarily advantageous if you have those attractiveness genes to have a girl because they can make more use of it. It's like, okay, maybe. Uh, although you could go the other way and say, well, actually, attractiveness is generally correlated with being in the dominant group, partly because healthy people are more attractive. Also, what's considered good looking depends on who's culturally dominant, who we look up to. Well, what do dominant people do? They dominate, and obviously, under similar evolutionary theory, it's men who benefit more from dominating than women, so therefore it can be evolutionary advantageous, blah, 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 blah. So just, you can pull it either way. Um, I'm going into detail here. I'm not going to go into detail on all the other examples. Just to emphasize, these are, are common threads. Um, and the I do think the one-way street fallacy is so easy to, it, it's like, it's like well, they're good people. This is in the right direction. Let's support it. Well, not everything goes in that direction, as you expect. So the replication, when we talk about the replication crisis, we usually talk about procedures and methods. I'm going to talk only a little bit about that. but. When people talk about procedures, they talk about pre-registration, they talk about avoiding p-hacking, about replication, a lot of good things. Um, one thing I want to, um, oh, and then when they talk about methods, we'll talk about, well, they might talk about multiple comparisons, corrections, different p-value thresholds. If you're, if you're me, you might talk about multi-level modeling and Bayesian inference. Um, great, okay. All the procedures in the world and all of the methods in the world will not turn a bad study into a good study. At best, what they'll do is they'll take data from a bad study, which a bad procedure and bad analysis pre were presented as being highly evidential. The good, a better procedure and a better theory, better and better, um, better statistical methods will, will weaken the evidential claim. Right. So the benefit of the benefit of procedure and methods in on, when it comes to um, policy and practice is indirect, mostly. It's that if you have a, it's harder to publicize that bad study. It's harder to get that TED talk. It's harder to become president of Stanford or, or, or whatever it might be um, if you happen to have benefited for, in some way from, from unreplicable research. It makes it harder to do that. Um, of course, if you're doing a good study, uh, good science, then better procedure and uh, better and better statistical methods will help you do gather more get more information from your data. So there's there's value to procedure, but I feel there's this funny thing in the science reform movement that uh, procedural innovations such as replication and pre-registration have been sold in a kind of Contradictory. It's the same way in, in, in like politics, like someone might say, this policy is great because it will make housing more affordable and it will raise it, it will raise the value of your home. It's like, <laughs> oh, and it will lower inflation and raise the stock market. And if, you know, like everything, like oh everything's good, right? Like that. So I think it's sold this way, replication as um, pre-registration, it's sold to the people who do the unreplicable work. It's, look. If you pre-register, your, if your study was pre-registered and it's replicated, people will believe you and they'll shut up. And then it's sold to skeptics like me as, look, if they'll pre-register, if you have to pre-register and replicate, people will stop believing. And in some sense, both of those cells are correct, just like these political arguments can, can be correct in both directions because economics is complicated. But it's like, I think that sometimes it's a good study and the pre-registration and the replication will allow someone to finally believe it. Sometimes it's bad, blah, 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 but people never think about it as the other thing might apply to them, right? Uh, and so, 
Okay, so that's usually what I end up talking about here. Um, the other, what I also then usually follow up with, I'm not going to do it so much for you, is to say what's really important is the substantive theory that's overlooked. So the problem with that beauty and sex ratio study was somehow, I mean, there was statistical and numeracy involved, um, but also the, the substantive theory was very weak. It did not make predictions. It was if the result had gone in the other direction, it would have been explainable too. It's like what they say about Freudian psychology and Marxist economics, um, that it's great, these theories are great because they can explain everything. They're, they're, they're wonderful, they're, they're unrefutable. Um, not all theories are like that. Some theories, of course, are, are, are specific. Um, but again, a focus on procedure and methods will can take the you can allow people to forget about the importance of substantive theory. And, and there's this idea that the theory methods will fix it. What I want to talk about to you, though, is something a little different, which is the political content of these theories, partly because of this seminar, which I, I looked at previous speakers, and there's a lot of political content in, in the previous talks. Um, and it's just something I think it's, I thought you'd be interested, but I think it's important, so I, I appreciate having the opportunity to. Um, again, at any time, feel free to interrupt, or even from your Zoom, feel free to interrupt. Andrew, you, you, you mentioned something about the way they measured attractiveness. Uh, were, you, were you going to say anything more about how they did that? Oh, well, I'm going to say it's a noisy measure. So they measure the attractiveness of the people with adolescents, and then they're using this to make the, the idea that attractiveness is inherent, an inherent quality of the person, and then it predicts the sex ratio. So I was just going to say that to the extent that attractiveness is a kind of a attribute of a person, it's measured with error. It's very noisy to measure. So even if there was, were such differences, which I'm doubtful that they'd be noticeable, they'd be much smaller in a study like this because you have a, it's well known that if your predictor is measured with error, it attenuates your, your estimate. Yes. I'm a PhD in evolutionary biology, so I'm just kind of curious what were their reasons for um, more attractive people having, how were they justifying it after the fact? Well, it was some, well they, they, something called the Trivers-Willard hypothesis. I, I actually emailed Trivers about it and said, look what's being done under your name. And Trivers was like, hey, it's not that bad, man. Like, you know, because they liked it. Yeah, he liked it because they, they were supportive of him. You know? Yeah, you know. <laughs> Like, come on, like whatever. It's, I had similar reactions sometimes with other unreplicable or studies where people who are ideologically supportive, I'm not saying politically ideology, maybe it's a scientific ideology, but they're kind of supportive of it. And so they're like, yeah, you know, like, sure, maybe, um, like, you know, don't be so hard on them like that. No, the theory <laughs> is exactly what I said, that it's beauty is a more valuable attribute for girls than for boys. Beauty runs in families. Therefore, it's evolutionarily advent. It's, I mean, of course, it's better for all families to have beautiful children because then they'll, you know, can reproduce, and blah, 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 blah. But it's more, it's a differential advantage. It's more of an evolutionary advantage um, for uh, families that have girls than for families that have boys. So this implies a kind of, that there is a, like, a track to, uh, uh, kind of attractor, you know, a more stable state evolutionarily where there's a slightly higher uh, chance of having a girl if um, you're in a more beautiful family. Uh, that theory obviously involves the optimal response to the male species. No, so you've, I, got to, no, you've got to write this model down no, 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 and figure okay. out the equilibrium. No, 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 I, 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 no, no. I'm not taking this theory seriously. What I'm saying is they had a theory which is published in the Journal of Theoretical Biology, which is a legitimate journal of biology. Um, but you could easily come up with a theory going the other direction, is my point. Um, okay, I, I'll just give you, to start out, because we're at Stanford, I'll give you a few examples from Stanford. Um, uh, there was a, a professor in the education school who threatened to call the cops on a computer scientist from another university who had questioned her claims where she had used data dredging to claim huge effects of an education program. Uh, outsiders could not find anything about it. It was reported um, in the news. 
Um, she uh, did unreplicable results about the purported effects of dropping algebra in middle school, which got her into trouble because a lot of people wanted their middle school kids to be able to take algebra. Um, there in a uh, she did a study of um, math learning, which she wrote shows that we don't uh, even hear that we don't even have to be aware we have made a mistake for brain sparks to occur. Brain sparks. Um, actually, the study did not measure awareness at all, um, which reminds me of a paper um, which which um, the title was was a long term experimental study of cumulative violent video game effects on hostile expectations and aggressive behavior. So it was a long term cumulative study. It was the study was done over three days. Now, in <laughs> lessons of the journal of fruit fly research, it is not long term. And then there is the study saying that a per they concluded with that a person can, by assuming two simple one minute poses, embody power and initially become more powerful, has oh has instantly, sorry, instantly become more powerful, has real world powerful implications. Uh, there was actually no mention in that paper of any measure of power. Um, or instantaneous anything or any real world implications. The statement in the abstract, so we had a paper where the title said something which was clearly inaccurate, another where the abstract made claims that were not in the paper. Sorry, those are from Ohio State and Harvard, so not Stanford. Um, I'm mentioning them because um, I don't have to talk about p hacking or, or replication or anything to say that they're writing stuff that wasn't what they did. Right? Um, more from Stanford, um, there was someone here uh, who, uh, I think he was a law professor of some sort, who claimed that uh, COVID was going to cause no more than 500 deaths, um, and then he upgraded his estimate to 5,000. I don't, I don't think he ever went back and sort of said, what did I do wrong? So this is a big issue. Um, it's kind of, you know, people are making mistakes and not going back and saying, what did I do wrong? How did that happen? When I make a mistake, it happens. I go back and say, what did I do wrong? I can learn from a mistake. So when I was a kid, that's what my dad told me. I was studying something and complaining about some tests. And he said, don't forget, you learn from making mistakes. You don't learn by doing it right. That's not completely right. You learn some for doing it right. But you, you learn from mistakes. So these people did not listen to my dad, uh, apparently. Um, that was from Stanford. Um, then um, there was a Stanford medical professor who got into trouble because he did some study that nobody could uh, figure out how it happened. And it was funded by Tony Robbins, the uh, noted rich person. Um, I guess if you're a rich person, you want even more money, you hang out with more rich people and, and so forth. Um, there was a Stanford medical school professor who wrote, oh, he didn't do the study, but he was quoted as saying a certain um, certain uh, procedure of, it had to do with how dietary restriction, something about its long-term adverse effect. Uh, the study was based on two days of diary data. Um, doesn't sound very long-term to me. Uh, there was another Stanford Medical School professor, so I should give this talk in the medical school, uh, who endorsed a study on the benefits of cold showers uh, which was later retracted, but you didn't need to see the retraction to know that it was a really bad study. Um, and um, the, there was a study, a uh, Stanford professor who has since moderated her views, um, but at the time uh, was kind of citing a study that, to be fair, she didn't do, claiming that mindset interventions increased people's test, kids' test scores by 31 points, like, or 31 percentage points, like got something, nothing increases anything by 31 percentage points, but indeed you can get that if you, if you look at, at noisy data. Uh, there was also a re recent study on the benefits <laughs> of replication, which had to be retracted because they didn't follow their own replication policies. Uh, there was a Stanford person involved in, in that one too. Um, so lots of lots of great stuff here. Um, now, okay, so it's for real, it's happening. Um, I have a long list I was gonna give you of other examples, um, 
where I, I won't um, actually. I'll give you just a couple. There was a claim that um, a certain intervention in, in preschoolers in Jamaica uh, increased adult earnings of these kids. It was a study, they, they were followed up 20 years later, increased adult, adult earnings by 42%. Well, that's a lot, increasing your adult earnings by 42%. Um, I have a little theory that if we could replace, there's two tenses. There's the continual pre, the continuing present tense, this is happening, and there's the future tense, this will happen. Um, oh, there's also the, 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 the present tense, is, okay? I think that if scientists would replace the present tense, the continual present tense, and the future tense, by the past tense would be much better. So instead of saying this intervention increases earnings by uh, 42%, which is the continuing present tense, or the effect is 42%, or if you do this, it will have this policy benefit, which is the future tense. We use the past tense. The earnings of the kids in the treatment group were 42%. And it was statistically significant, which means that you cleverly designed a study in which there are multiple ways of analyzing your data so that you could find statistically statistical so, significance. Andrew, if yes. I just may sort of make that a point here. The Berkeley. Um, in defense of my medical school colleagues. You, know, um, you also see in many other fields, like statistics, you might see something claiming this statistical procedure will, you know, increase things dramatically based on some poorly done simulation at best. And, you know, so it's not, this isn't just a problem of these narrow little behavioral studies. It's I agree. I, I, I agree. Um, the statistical stuff, sure. <laughs> Unfortunately, the Stanford people don't do that. They're really good. Stanford's, you know, a top statistics department. Um, so I didn't have any Stanford statistics yeah. examples. No, I have a, a colleague in machine learning uh, who complains about this, that machine learning, uh, be, it's notorious that people set the tuning parameters and their algorithm wins in their example. The examples aren't represented in the general population. The analogy would be, this wasn't part of the talk, but like you flew me out here so you can get some stuff for free here. The advantage, the, 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 the analogy would be, imagine a medical study which is completely kosher, done fine, but it's just a study of these people in these hospitals with these conditions who won't necessarily generalize. Yeah. Statistics will, in machine learning, computer science, we evaluate a new procedure on our favorite problems. And there's like, it's only, they're not all the problems you might see in there. There's a selection of what works and what doesn't. So that's huge. And, and yeah, I, I agree. Um, you know, we should get our own house in order too. Yes. Okay, let me play devil's advocate here. Principia. What? Principia. Newton's book is wrong, right? So where do you draw the line between the reason, part of research is people publish ideas and then people follow those ideas and sometimes they turn out to be wrong and sometimes they turn out to be right and that's the process from something like, um, well, they shouldn't have published the paper because it's wrong. I want people to accurately describe what they did. So I haven't read, you know, I don't read Latin, so I didn't read Newton's book. Um, but like, I assume that either he accurately described what he did, his mathematical steps, or maybe he did what's called a rationalized reconstruction. That is, maybe he lied, like Freud made stuff up. Um, and then, you know, ultimately you have to value, evaluate it based on the contributions it made. To the extent that it's a theoretical contribution, if Newton lied in how he came up with the ideas, that doesn't invalidate the theoretical contribution. In the same way that Freud's theoretical contributions are said to have value um, if we subtract out from what wasn't said. So I'm not saying these things can't have value. Actually, I think these particular things don't have value. <laughs> yes. But I'm not saying they can't have value. I'm not saying, um, I actually wrote about this. How do you differentiate? If you want to say, we want to differentiate, how do you do it? Uh, my job is not to assess its value. I can give you opinion, my opinion, which is fine, but I can say that the, that the paper is inaccurate, that this was not a long-term study. I can say that for statistical reasons, there is no way that this study could find any reasonably plausible effect. So I can sometimes do close reading, <coughs> and, and, and all the time, you just look at what people say. There is a paper recently, I'll, I'll, I'll get to you. There's a paper recently on, um, Who's having some of this mind-body healing stuff? Uh, that, that's that's a Harvard one, so you can be, feel. Huh? 
comfortable, not liking that. And one thing that my colleague and I did, we, it's a bit of a persuasive looking paper. We looked carefully at their data. We looked carefully at what they did. They made some statistical mistakes. Then we looked at their references. We carefully read the ref reference papers. And then we see that it's, um, you know, they didn't say quite what they said. So a lot of it is that kind of forensics. But then some of it is knowing the statistics. I often tell my students that one of the biggest benefits of statistics, knowing statistics or math, is that you don't get snowed by people who give you bad statistics. It's similar to econ. It's not that econ 101 is always correct, or even econ 201. It's just, it, but it, it will kind of protect you a little, perhaps, from, from things that are wrong. So, you know, let me, that's my contribution for you. Thank you. Uh, I, I just wanted to uh, understand exactly the level of your critique when you're talking about talking in the past tense. So I, my understanding of, as a social scientist, I, I think that the purpose of social science is to understand how humans behave. So it is an argument about human nature or human culture, right? In, in Fair the, enough. The so yes, okay. I agree. Let me not say that social scientists should not use the present, continuing, present, and future tenses. Okay, I yes. want, let me say, I'm a social scientist too, let me say that we should distinguish between our evidence, which is from the past tense, and our inference, which is from, from the future tense. And there's nothing wrong, for example, in saying here were a bunch of published papers saying that like 40 different things cause cancer or, or whatever. Um, you say that that's what happened. They found that, they claim that. Um, it's just that it's, I often see this, that the inference is whatever. I don't want to keep talking about that particular point. Um, but yeah, sure, what you said. Um, okay, uh, there was a claim from Harvard um, that um, the replication from the psychology department, that the replication rate was is statistically indistinguishable from 100%. <laughs> you know, that's a kind of funny thing because this is again we see in politics, which is that people lead themselves off the cliff. Like we did some studies, we like these studies. The people who criticize these studies are haters. They're either bullies or they're jealous losers, like one or the other, maybe both. Um, we, um, our studies are correct. They've been replicated. Well, not really, but like, yeah, they've been replicated. If you look carefully at replications, they're often under different conditions. Okay, our replication rate is higher than you might think. You can trust these p-values. The replication rate is statistically indistinguishable from 100%. And all of a sudden, you're like Wiley Coyote, and you're like you know, standing in a cloud, right? Like the cliff was over there. So there is, there's a kind of rhetorical logic. And so when people say things that are ridiculous, Smart people say things that are ridiculous. It's worth understanding. Like, how did they get to that point? Like, how did they how did they get into the habit of saying things um, like that? Um, what's the reason? Um, okay. Um, as Michael Kinsley put it in another context, the scandal isn't what's illegal. Uh, the scandal is what's legal. Uh, that people will say all these things that are not descriptive of, of what's happening. Um, one way I say this, I, it, let me also get back to your, your question earlier, or comment like, like maybe this stuff has value anyway. Um, and I've, I've thought a lot about this. Um, the way I like to say it is that making scientific decisions based on noisy data, very noisy data, is a little like outsourcing your decision making to random numbers. It can be valuable. So Philip K. Dick supposedly wrote some books using the I Ching, where he would actually like drop the bones and use it to decide his plot elements. And he wrote some really great books. Like he he was wonderful. Now my point is not oh Philip K. Dick could do it. He's a genius, whatever. But if you think of what did he do? He didn't write the book. You know, the I Ching was not in his chat bot, right? He didn't write the book that way. He used it to kind of jog himself around, like little Brownian motion moves him around like a stochastic algorithm. You're trying to do better. You add some randomness and you can improve without getting stuck. If you try to write the plot, the book from scratch, you end up with a tightly plotted book. He's not trying to be Agatha Christie, right? Like it's a different kind of book. Similarly, you can, I, you can argue, you can make the argument, and I'm not necessarily disagreeing that a savvy scientist could make scientific progress through a series of random numbers, a series of forking path studies that don't replicate, because each time the scientist is using this random result as a way to kind of 
push, you know, think about the issue a little more and then maybe they can move forward. So it could be the case. Like, I, I don't want to deny that that's um, possible. Um, however, one issue, I, and it's similar with journals, publish that paper on ESP. It might be right, you know? Let's say, write an article in the New York Times that maybe UFOs are space aliens. It could be, right? Whatever it is, okay? And the only thing I want you to think about, and this is kind of political, not left-right political, but political in the sense of politics, is what outlandish fringe ideas get to hear, right? Why are they writing about UFOs being space aliens and not writing about the hollow earth theory, right? Why are they, you know, whatever it is, like there is some privilege going on there. There's not necessarily I don't mean privilege in the sense that there's a list of people who get to decide, but somehow they're the insiders. The ESP paper was published by a, was written by a renowned Cornell professor. Well, being a Cornell professor doesn't count for as much as it used to be because they've had so many replication scandals at Cornell, but, but still like he was using that. It's fine, I use my, credentials to publish things too. When I publish things, I say I'm in Columbia. Like, it, I play the game too. I don't, I don't think the solution to politics, political problems is to not do politics. I'm not gonna unilaterally disarm. And, and I think it makes sense. Credentials from a Bayesian point of view have some value. I'm just saying the, the ideal of open-mindedness is not as simple as you think, because which open-minded ideas get the TED Talks and which open-minded ideas get funding from Tony Robbins and, and which open-minded ideas get a new nudge unit established in the US and in the UK. Um, like which are these things? Who, who gets in? That's it's not like a pure science approach is even possible. Again, I just want to be aware that 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 the idea of openness is not a necessarily a virtue in, in itself. Um, okay, I I'm going to get to the politics in, in, in a moment, um, kind of at the end, um, but let me talk about a few issues. So um, one issue is that, like, how does this happen, right? Why does this happen? It's not, it's not entirely or even mostly that people are bad guys and, and whatever. I, I think almost all of the people who do incompetent or even fraudulent, misrepresented work, I think they think they're correct in a, in a, in a deep sense. So what are some causes? Speaking, I say this not as a statistician so much, just as a social scientist or as a spec, speculating on it. Um, statistics is hard. Okay, I have a couple quotes for you. Um, here's one. Um, it was um, a statement about a later completely unreplicated claim about embodied cognition, the so-called slow walking study, which I won't tell you about, but it's one of the most notorious unreplicated study. Uh, here's a quote. Someone wrote, you have no choice but to accept that the major conclusions of these studies are true. Well, as that this was stated by Daniel Kahneman, the late Daniel Kahneman, brilliant guy, expert on the assessing of evidence, an expert on people being misled by bad evidence. Yet he said this, he was misled. Here's another one uh, from 1950. I assume that the reader is familiar with the idea of extrasensory perception and the meaning of the four items of it, viz, telepathy, clairvoyance, precognition, and psychokinesis. Always a bad sign when people start getting technical about things that aren't technical, right? These disturbing phenomena seem to deny all our usual scientific ideas, how we would like to discredit them. Unfortunately, the statistical evidence, at least for telepathy, is overwhelming. Who said that? Possibly the greatest assessor of evidence in human history, Alan Turing, a guy who won World War II <laughs> by assessing evidence. Okay, now my point is not like, oh yeah, Turing, you know, like, like Kahneman, like these guys, you know, they're nothing like, you know, uh, back then, like, you know, a, a, you know, someone on the bench could hit harder than Babe Ruth, you know, like you stick Kareem in the NBA now, he wouldn't, you know, his guy would get stuff. I'm not saying that. The, I think Kahneman and Kahneman, I mean, I don't need to say this, that Kahneman and Turing have made great, have made have made in their lives greater contributions to the assessment of evidence than I will ever make. Probably all of us in this room together will ever make. Um, 
They're great, but yet they got it wrong. And on high profile items, they got it wrong. And items where you'd kind of be embarrassed, items that are kind of silly. So assessing evidence is hard. It's just so easy to, to, to do that. I, I remember a couple of years ago, I was doing an election forecast with The Economist. And at one point we had Joe Biden having a 93% chance of winning in the electoral college. Well, he won, and actually our 95% interval was fine. Like it was, I don't think it was so bad, but at the time I wrote, I talked to my colleague at The Economist magazine and I wrote a blog post like, would we really bet, do we really believe 93%? I don't think so, I don't really believe it. Like this is coming from our model, why don't we believe it, we assess this. Now you don't see these guys doing this, right? They're not like, oh, my assessment of evidence and says the evidence for telepathy is overwhelming, therefore maybe my assessment is wrong. They didn't, they didn't you know, they, they didn't think about it. Reputation goes both ways, right? Um, so yeah, so my point is just that it's hard. Okay. There's a second thing, which is a kind of work hard and play by the rules attitude. I have a lot of sympathy for scientists. Okay, I know a lot about statistics. I program computers all the time, use random number generators. I have spent approximately five minutes of my life worrying about whether the pseudo-random number generators <laughs> on my computer are really random. I trust them, okay? Now, there is this thing, you can get random numbers from like this computer program. There's a computer that's connected to a radioactive decay that gives you real random numbers. Although people say, you better not use that because if there's any bias in the, you know, like in the wire connecting it, like it might not be random. So I use the pseudo random numbers. It, it, I just trust them. If somebody told me everything I did was wrong because of that, I'd be really annoyed. Like, oh, did you know your Mac is a chip? Like Stan is wrong. Like I try to check these things because we run, you know, we run stuff on test problems all the time. The point is that I think a lot of these scientists Statistics is to them a kind of form of paperwork, or at, at best, it's like what I think of random number generators. It's an incredibly useful tool they don't have to think about. At worst, they think of it as I think of the IRB. It's paperwork. You know, yeah, yeah, I'm not going to cheat. Don't worry, I'll do it. Like, yeah, whatever. Like, you know, if I get it wrong, we'll fix it later. Okay. So they were being told for all these times, you know, you better compute your p-value, you better compute your p-value, you, you need to ask me less than 0.05. And then all of a sudden they're like, no, you can't use the p-value. I don't believe the p-value or p-hacking. They are like, look at me like, you told me for 20 years, you told me to use the p-value. Now you're telling me not to. It's like, I'm not the one who told you that. That was somebody else. But they don't see that. Like, well, I'm just part of the, you know, be like, what? The administration told me to fill out this form, and then the administration told me to fill out that form. They're not the same people in the administration, but to me, they're just the administration. It's, you know, the blob, whatever that Star Trek term is. Um, and so, okay, so I think that's another issue. Um, also, it's surprisingly hard to say exactly what you did. Even Tversky and Kahneman, in their classic 1974 paper on um, judgment under uncertainty, described a lot of experiments very quickly without saying what they did, actually. You can't figure it out. The information isn't there. Now, I have a theory about this. And my theory is that, and maybe things will be better, because I'll tell you what my theory is. My theory is that we mostly learn from textbooks. And so when we start writing, we write textbooks. And you'll see this with your PhD students, right? That their PhD thesis, if they're not careful, what they do is write a textbook. And then you're like, oh, wait, what was the actual question words you mean? What <laughs> wording did you measure? Who were the people in your study? Where did you get their data? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, you know, whatever. Like, they don't put that in because the textbooks just tell you stories, right? They don't give the evidence. They don't say exactly what happened. And so it's very hard to just say what you did. I remember a, a few years ago, I had a, a conversation with a colleague about this topic of why academic writing is so bad. And he gave a kind of George Orwell politics in the English language response, like academics are bullshitting, they're telling you stuff isn't true. And so they use really bad language. You probably use the term like turgid language or something like that, because like they're trying to hide it, you know, what they haven't done anything. I don't think so. It's just hard to write clearly. You know, how do you write clearly? You write something and then you add a few words, you add a few words and you can't find the first thing and then you put it in bold, and you too much in bold and you look like you're like some nut on the internet and all caps. Like, it's just hard. It's hard to write. Um, and then that gets you back to the incentives. Well, there aren't, like, there's a lot of incentives to getting things wrong and, and, and so forth. But I think there are some kind of fundamental issues um, involved. Um, now, there are some potential solutions. So, for example, there was, I have a colleague who did 
uh, something called a replication market a few years ago, where they took a bunch of studies and they organized pre-registered replications and they had people bet on the studies, like expert type people, like which do you think will replicate? And the betters were pretty good, which suggests there's a lot of information in the metadata. Uh, so yeah, they're not, you're not that study in ESP and intercessory prayer, it's probably not gonna replicate. On the other hand, that study where like they hit people on the head with a two by four and then they have a headache, yeah, I think that's gonna replicate. People are pretty good. So the point about this in some ways is obvious, although not obvious until, until you find out, right? Um, but also um, the value of the metadata when I'm just using jargon there, but the value of, of all this information is not in kind of the usual scientific publication framework. So the usual framework is like, you publish something, it's supposed to be important, and it's supposed to be you know, correct in the sense that there's evidence for it, but not that the theory be plausible or that the, and oh, it's tricky, you, you can't necessarily like only publish things you already believed ahead of time. Um, that's one reason we do things like replications. Like there are procedures that allow us to gradually shift our belief. But the point is, there's a lot of evidence out there. But if you look at a scientific paper, they'll tend not to say that. It, it, what they'll tend to say is, this result was a complete surprise to me. And it's completely predicted by theory. It's a little like when you write a grant proposal. You say, this is something that's completely new. We haven't done it, so fund it. But by the way, we know it's going to work. Because, in fact, I have heard that NIH sometimes has an implicit requirement that you get a statistically significant result in your pilot study, which is really evil because the purpose of a pilot study is to, to demonstrate feasibility, um, not, not, to est not to estimate the effect of it. Um, Can I ask you a question about yes. allocating effort to replication projects? So I think one thing you've alluded to is maybe there's a lot of, there's a huge long tail of studies that are super low quality and silly, self-evidently. Yeah, let's not replicate them. Then this came up, somebody, I think several years ago this came up and, and I gave the analogy of, um, I can't remember the analogy I gave, but this came up, someone said like, here's some study like the ovulation and the ovulation and voting study, which claimed that women during a certain time of the month were 20 percentage points more likely, or whatever, some stupid thing. It's like, do I recommend a pre-registered replication? No, it's a waste. And to me, it's not where I would put my money. Um, if they want to do it, if they want to be convinced, and then if they want to be convincing, maybe they should do it. Like they, it obviously matters to somebody. So I'm not saying that these things should be forbidden. Um, I would not allocate my own resources to them, um, except you know, maybe some small amount, right? So, so what well, would your criteria be for what would be worth? Luckily, I'm not, I mean, my criteria for allocating my own resources, like I pay people on things that I think are, are likely to have you know, benefit, like so we'll learn something unexpected or, or we'll demonstrate something we already believe in a way that's convincing to other people. Um, I have not been on government or industry panels where people have asked me how much to allocate, how much money to allocate repli to replications or what should I, what should be done. I think I like, I mean, things like the uh, betting market study I like, I think it's a small amount of resources compared to the total scientific endeavor. And for that matter, I spend time criticizing bad research and I could be doing my own good research. Well, I've learned a lot from criticizing bad research. I've learned more from my own mistakes, but I learned a lot from other people's mistakes too. Um, so, yeah, I don't, don't have an answer. No, and that, that's a tension I'm kind of like puzzling on. I've written a few of these replications, the shark attacks one that you and I discussed. Um, and the criticism I get from people in the discipline is, you should be writing new, interesting work. Why are you wasting your time on what was obviously an idiotic well, study? I mean, part of it's a division of labor. There's like most people don't do any replication studies. Um, and yeah, I've had people say like, well, you do replication studies, why don't you do anything else? I do other stuff, right? It's like, you know, shut up, you know. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's just part of the portfolio and some people like doing this. And, and some people, there are some people who only do this. Like, and that's cool too. Like they're, what are they called? The data thugs. And um, like I wrote a paper with one of them. It was great. Like he, he you know, eagle eye, you know, so it was good. So yeah, I think there's, there is room for it. I, I mean, since we're talking about efficient use of resources, I'll give you a quickie. This is one of my, my pet ideas. I haven't written it up yet. It's, it's with a business school professor at Boston University. Um, that 
okay, reviewer resources are wasted. So every paper gets reviewed. In fact, the worst papers get reviewed more. Like I have a paper, must have been pretty bad because I had to send it to five journals before it was published. I actually like it, but like, let's say there's evidence that it's bad. It got 15 reviews, right? On the other hand, someone great, great paper, brilliant theory, just, just discovered, you know, prove Fermat's last theorem, you know, whatever it is, uh, get three reviews, it published. Okay, that's done. So the wor more reviewing effort that's spent on the worst papers, then we do post-publication review. So it suggests we should only do post-publication review because huge masses of reviews are wasted on papers that nobody's ever going to read. Or do less of it. I have a proposal that we have organized post-publication reviews where every time a paper gets cited 100 times, it gets post-publication review. Like, why not? It's cheap. You can do a calculation. So few papers get cited 100 times um, that you will, like, uh, it won't cost much. It'll cost like you know, increase the review burden by one percent, and then you're having outside reviewers of paper that people actually read. I mean, less than my less than half of my papers are cited a hundred times. Like, I mean, just like most papers aren't. Yes. Okay, I'm going to play devil's advocate again. Okay, and I really am on your side. But no, okay. don't take too much time to the politics. Okay, yeah. but I, I think in economics people would say that. The, the crap papers, everybody ignores. The good papers, people want to build on. And on the building, they do replication. Oh, yeah. I think there is some of that, for sure. So I'm just saying we could do better. So, yeah, like, when I do post-publication review, it's because the paper got at least, either I care about it or it got at least enough attention that someone emailed me and sent me an email saying, dear Professor Gelman, please do not use your name because I don't want to piss off people in my department, but I don't believe this. And every time, sometimes I post something saying, someone wrote this and I actually think this paper is fine. Like, you know, like it happens. <laughs> right? um, and sometimes I write and I criticize and they're like, yeah, good point. You know, like whatever. Um, so yeah, there's, okay, just, okay. That, sure, I think that is done. I think also masses of effort are spent reviewing scientific papers. We agree. And, and so we could maybe do a little, maybe spend that effort a little more efficiently um, would, would be my, my hope. Yes. Andrew, about the, the post-publication review at 100 uh, citations, I like that idea, but the challenge is that to, to do it meaningfully, you need to have the data, you need to have the code, you need to have, you know, really what, what really happened there. And, uh, I can tell you my experience trying to create a data arc of the, the most cited papers in each scientific field. Uh, we reach out to investigators, we tell them we will curate your data and code and everything you know, very few, for, for free. And oh, yeah, uh, very, very few do that. Oh, yeah. I mean, in fact, the default is to say no. In, in fact, when they get back to things like IRBs, like it's easy to say no, it's hard to say yes, because you say yes, someone might get mad. If you say no, like you and I will get mad, but the university won't get mad. I agree. I'm speaking not of that kind of deep review. That's great. Um, when I'm saying a review, I actually just mean the same kind of review that like a referee report for a journal. You don't need to see the original data, but you assess the claims. You say stuff like, hey, the title said uh, a long-term study, but it was only to, it was only uh, you know three days, right? Hey, what's up with that? The abstract said this. What's up with that? What you claim this p-value, but there are other things you could have done, like stuff that that kind of review is all I'm asking for. The other thing is important too. That's the kind of thing where like NIH can get involved and say if you don't share your data, we're taking the money back. And that, that, that's true. That's true too. I I'm really thinking of a shallower solution than what you're talking about. Yeah. So like some papers are clearly junk. And others, um, you know, a skilled skeptic could find something to quibble about. So, do you have like habits for how you distinguish between a reasonable versus an unreasonable doubt? I think I want to put the criticism out there, and it's not the point. Is not like you know one chink in the armor, and the study is no good. I don't see a role of having to decide whether it's no good. Now, somewhere someone's deciding, right? Like the the the, the, the funder is deciding should we fund further research. You know, that's kind of up to them. I mean, I I, I don't think like I think people do have to weigh the evidence qualitatively in, in some sense. Um, but often bad things go together. Like the the paper on the beauty and sex ratio had a mix of bad theory, bad statistics, bad engagement with criticism, and extreme politics. And you put that together. They, well, well, here, so we have a, wait, 
I, two more. Yeah. yeah. Um, so if there's so much um, wasted effort with peer reviewing as it currently is, do you think that there's um, very little use to having traditional academic journals? Should should we all revert to like a preprint, basically, as the default publishing? My my proposed solution 15 years ago was to replace journals by re recommender systems. So yeah, I would say stick everything up on the preprint server, and then the journals become we recommend this. And I can imagine intermediate things like my papers are invariably improved, not invariably, usually improved by the reviewer comments. Sometimes they find actual errors, other things. So it can be great. I think if the effort were spent efficiently, that would would, would be good. Um, so that would be my ideal. Um, although it's it's unstable. Like to get from here to there is tough because if you switch to that, all of a sudden you won't get all this free labor and the reviews. So I don't know if it's easy to get from point A to point B. I, I just we have a chance. question from Eric. Yeah, going back. Am I on Zoom? Going back to the. Uh, okay, let's get one Zoom and then let me finish the talk after the Zoom. And then oh, we can do John's question after that. Okay, I'll, I'll take your Zoom question. If you Eric, go ahead. Okay, yes. Post-publication review. Um, I wonder if it might talk about what you would do with it. One way is just to have everybody's comments and then readers of the article online can see the negative comments. Another would be for the editor then to, to require a revision and or even to retract the paper and say not not a retraction for, for fraud but just to say this isn't as good as i thought okay what do you think about those okay so a couple thoughts first like in some sense this is not the conversation i want to have with you because i feel like most of the time when people talk about the replication crisis they get into all these potential solutions and what the hell do i know about solutions right i'm just i'm a practitioner so i will respond to your question and it's my bad for bringing it up um, well, we, it's, not, it's not really what I came here to talk about. Briefly, my, our proposal, I mean, there's, it's, I let the thousand flower bloom, so you should have things like pub peer and all that, but also I was actually thinking the journal would commission the review and publish the review. I would not ask, I would not be involved in retracting the paper. I would allow the author to retract or correct if they would like to. I would not require revisions. That's a huge amount of work. Often these are old papers. I think it's enough to have the review out there and the signed review out there and, 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 and move on. Retraction is not scalable. I will have a story. I was an associate editor of a political science journal, and there is some paper that apparently there is universal agreement like that the paper was wrong. And so I was like, hey, let's retract it. And someone's like, you can't retract it. There's no, there's no misconduct. So I looked at the official committee on publication ethics. Retraction does not require misconduct. Retraction is not a punishment, blah, blah, blah. They wouldn't do it. They said, even so, it feels like a punishment. I don't want to go there. I don't mind to this whole punishment thing. Um, someone wrote, 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 once wrote a post saying, Andrew Gelman is not the plagiarism police because there is no plagiarism police. And indeed, there is no police in this situation. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, so yeah, okay, let's stop talking about that, even though I brought it up. Okay, well, I'll talk about politics briefly. So I gave you, a, one reason I gave you a bunch of examples is because the bad stuff happens on the left and on the right. And I can give you more examples, but I gave you enough already because I think some of this um, education stuff was coming on the left. Um, some of the COVID denial stuff was coming on the right. The beauty and sex ratio was coming on the right. Um, you got stuff like the like the Tony Robbins. It's not left or right. Like I think it's a little left. Or, or the or the guy who the the uh, medical school Stanford guy who's a podcaster who sells sup advertises supplements and put, put now you know what else is the left or right like i don't know like he's he has a podcast that kind of sounds like he's on the right like on the other hand <laughs> he's saying like hey you can like cure yourself that's a kind of leftist kind of thing like <laughs> mind, mind body do well a lot of these studies have this like mind body you know your mind can cure your body which is kind of vaguely a, a, a leftist thing don't believe western medicine blah 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 and kind of a rightist thing too in the sense that hey dr oz he endorsed donald trump and and, and so forth. So you can really go, oh, but he was on Oprah and she endorsed uh, uh, Barack Obama. So, so it's, it's, it's a mix. That doesn't mean they have no political content. I think they actually can have both left and right political content. 
Um, so, for example, if you take something like a, a claim that if you hold your body in a certain way, that you'll be able to like do better in a job interview. Well, first, it might be bad advice because the time you spend focusing your pose might have been better to spend that minute rehearsing what were you going to say. It's insulting to job interviewers. Like who, who's like, if I'm interviewing people for a job, I don't care if they slouch. You know, it's not clear who, who, the, who these things are. It has a, 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 a liberal or left wing kind of um, penumbra to it in the sense of, again, like individual empowerment, perhaps the reason why some groups are not treated as fairly is because other people are prejudging them based on shallow factors. And, and so forth. It also has a as a kind of rightist or conservative take, which is that hey, like you can market better, you can be a better marketer and sell people things uh, by just manipulating them in this way. So this kind of like the consumer is the other, um, and you know there. So it's a kind of anti-autonomy view. It's the same thing as the nudge people who um, I guess they worked for Obama, where nudging from their point of view they're the nudgers nudging people and it's all it's libertarian paternalism who could who could mind that well everybody maybe um but from i think like i'm the kind of person who's being nudged and i don't like that right and it's it's like someone once said like in business school they're always talking about the guy who who um you know, I was talking about the guy who founded McDonald's. I want to hear more about the people who eat at McDonald's. You know, like it's like, which, which side are you? And, and a lot of this work is implicitly putting you on one side or the other. So it has political content even when it's not left or right, even when you have people um, do that. Now, politics is, I think, sometimes used as a kind of defense by people. So, for example, some of the work on which I believe overstates the effect of preschool programs is promoted by economists who are known to be politically conservative. And I think they kind of feel like, well, I'm a conservative, but I support this. It must really be correct. Like they're playing against type or some of the, the nudge people tend to be on the, on the left or the center left. And I think then when they come up with a, a conclusion, they can say, well, I'm on the left, but still I think this is okay. Right? So people, Politics is kind of used as a form of leverage sometimes. And I think we, we see a lot of that at the university. We think kind of both ways. We definitely see people saying, look, I'm on this side, and anyone who criticizes me is on the other side, right? But you, then you, other, you also see this leverage thing where it's, I'm on this side, yet I say this, and this is supposed to give me credit. Um, uh, so that's, a, that's kind of, let me, Okay, so let me put it another way. So if we take things like embodied cognition, certain what I'll call implausible stories of evolutionary psychology or in un un unfalsifiable theories, nudging, effects of policy interventions, um, the manipulable voter model, which, which I didn't talk about them, those are so much fun. The idea that the election outcome is partially determined by college football games. Uh, no, it's not ridiculous. Your team wins the weekend before the election. You're happy. You vote for the incumbent. It's not so ridiculous. On the other hand, like when people tried to replicate it with the NFL, it didn't work. But it's like then the original people were like, oh, yeah, but that's the NFL, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was someone who scampered too, actually. Sorry. Um, okay. There are a lot of things like this for the ovulation voting example, the manipulable voter model, which as a voter, I find annoying because I don't like to be manipulated. As a manipulator, as they see themselves, um, they might just absolutely love it. The point is, these models, if true, if there are large and consistent effects, if it's true that a subliminal smiley face can affect, can, can, can shift your attitude on immigration by 18 percentage points, as has been claimed by a prominent political science professor, if that's true, that's important. We should know that. I shouldn't laugh at it. I have to we change my, my view of the world. Um, on the other hand, if there is no such evidence for that, that should affect our views of the world also. So Isn't it, like that's one particular example. This manipulable voter thing is very interesting where we kind of know it can't be true because we know in the aggregate we can predict election results. And if smiley faces had that effect, we'd have to infer there's a thousand other ridiculous things with equally exactly. large. Exactly. That's the point of our piranha paper. 
that you can't have a large number of effects. There's a folk wisdom is that if you have a fish tank full of piranhas, soon you'll have a, no more than one piranha um, because they'll eat each other. Similarly, there cannot be a hundred different things that each have large and consistent effects on your vote because then like people are voting based on, then it's like brownie emotion. You're like a little, you're like a little particle being bounced around so much. Like, but people's votes are pretty predictable. And, and so you're, you're exactly right. Um, so that's a theoretical reason why that, that, that can't hold. And then empirically, we can look at papers one at a time and see this problem. If this were true, it would have important implications supporting certain views held on the left, right, and technocratic center. On the, I'll get to you in a second. On the left, the view is that ah, it's all being run by you know, these guys in the back room. You're manipulating, what is it? Manufactured consent. Uh, you know, your, your, your vote doesn't mean anything. On the right, you get like, oh, you know, voting is bogus, uh, voters are idiots. That's the kind of, that's the conservative take on it. Like, stop voting. Nobody should vote because voters are stupid and that's why taxes should be lowered um, because we don't trust the government. And then the technocratic center, it's like, yeah, we can manipulate people. That's great. That's great. Just hire me, you know. And, but yeah, as I said, the lack of empirical support for that, that people are not so arbitrarily swayed that should affect our view too. And I just want to end, and then I'll get to your question. I want to end by comparing it to the traditional, what we might call the traditional behaviorist models of political science and sociology and economics, which is that people vote for reasons, uh, people play roles. Say, like if you feel my role as a voter, I might take my vote seriously, even though it's not instrumentally valuable to me because I'm playing a role. I'm the voter, um, and they're economics incentives too. Like traditional social science is pretty reasonable. And I want to emphasize that a lot of this unreplicable stuff, manipulable voter models, mind body, you know, the, the things, all, all that, a lot of the stuff that hasn't really held up is really not necessarily wrong, not anti-scientific exactly, but really outside the mainstream. It's not necessary. It's not like the way like nudging is presented is it's behavioral economics instead of a naive view that people are utility maximizers, we now have something more sophisticated. That's bogus, right? Take all behavior economists. I mean, you know, the, the utility theory exists, but it's not like economists like outside of textbooks, maybe it's not like economists are saying that everyone acts this way. Like the kind of mainstream theories of social science are quite reasonable. And these, these kind of studies, again, if they were true, it would be worth noting, but it's not like we have to say that this is like, that they're, they're almost like presented, like it's like in this TED talk world, they're simultaneously presented as being revolutionary, exciting, counterintuitive, and at the same time, same time, this is what you should believe. And you don't have to believe that. There is a choice, um, all that. So that's the end of that. Okay. So, um, but uh, there's a question. Yeah, so let me just say, Ken and George, and then online, if you raise your hands, I'll get to you. Okay. Okay. So the, the normative implications of this are fairly different. If So the way you've described, you gave lots of examples on the left, lots of examples on the right, lots of examples on the center. You know, the normative implications are one thing if it's kind of like broadly dispersed across the political spectrum, that there are sort of politically, you know, you know, unreplicable goal studies or lousy studies that have some policy or political implication. But I think that some people might think that there's actually a systematic bias. And so I'll just toss out a hypothesis and say the hypothesis would be that many academic fields are by and large populated by people on the left. And so the authors, the reviewers, the editors tend to give a little bit less scrutiny to things that align with their political leanings to begin with. That's a theoretical argument. And then you would have more of a political skew of where the lousy studies tend to land. And they tend to be more common amongst the studies on the left. Now, I thought, I was wondering if you were gonna come in and talk about that. I spent some time before the talk thinking about like, what would be the research design? What would you use to assess that hypothesis? That seems like actually a fairly hard hypothesis to assess because you need the pool of potential studies or the pool of studies that are that are file drawer versus not file drawer. You know how they go through the review process. I'm not worried about the file drawer. Okay. I think academics will publish everything. 
Okay. The founder is not the problem. Yeah. The problem is that the within this, it's selection within yeah. a particular paper. But sure, great, great. I mean, yeah, I, I How agree. How do you assess that? Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's funny. It seems like a relevant hypothesis. No, right. It's not a crazy one. The second half of your question was going to be my response to the first half of your question, which is I have not studied it um, in any kind of systematic way. Um, and it, it would be interesting to say it would be difficult to study it systematically. Um, so I don't I don't really know. Um, and I so the, the, this talk does not have that empirical component. It is fundamentally anecdotal in that way. And we always lots of insights. It's hard to pick just uh, one question here, but I'll, I'll do my best. There's about 7 million papers published every year. Roughly, what would be your estimate of how many of them politics uh, are important? And therefore, uh, probably something needs to be done about it, I guess. Would that be more transparency, uh, kind of asking for disclosures that uh, all these people let's say are advocates and belong in these teams and have done this and that. I mean, you know, we, we cannot ask people to, to tell us what they voted, uh, but you know, for some kind of important uh, activities, probably we could have that. And, 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 and linked to that, um, you know, th this whole system of, of appraising or reviewing or, or re-reviewing or post-publication review, um, Unavoidably, it has experts on board. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm probably the least likely to be supportive of expertise as a, as a concept, but I, I have to notice that um, if, if we throw expertise completely uh, out the window, then we're left with very little to be able to do most of, of what we do. And, and you know, your, your examples of Kahneman and Turing, I would argue uh, these statements were not really their expertise. It, it's a little bit like having an, an immunologist talking about statistics or oh, no. assessing, the about assessing the strength of evidence, Turing theory of expertise. I agree it's not his number one, but it's the same sense when I review a psychology paper. Yeah, I, I, I can't assess the evidence on astrophysics. I mean, you know, no, I, but, <laughs> no, no, I, I no, might be just base I, I expert, think, but <laughs> I think that to this, the, like, I think that that he, he knew enough about the assessment of evidence to have at least have said something like, well, but, the evidence but, is But my point comes to, I mean, we, we can leave Turing and, and Kahneman aside. And the, the point is that, you know, you want review or re-review by someone who's knowledgeable. And I, I would argue that uh, if, if you have an embedded and entrenched uh, kind of literature, I mean, we, we know that even thoroughly refuted experiments like you know multi-labs 50 experiments none of them showing ego depletion the ego depletion papers keep cited by okay. thousands of people okay. yeah. so if, if you ask an expert in ego depletion yeah. no, no, say, no, I, it's I a wonderful know. paper <laughs> so okay so there's a saying that the problem with peer review is the peers and my take on peer review is well i think it is good to have the outside experts Okay, but my take on peer review is not so much, oh, it's bad and it should be replaced with something else. I want to say peer review is what it is, which means the peers can just So the peers can tell you, oh, you weren't citing this reference. Uh, the peers can say, you did something different than what's usually done. Why did you do that? That was different. The peers cannot go outside the system, right? It's like a Cantor's paradox thing, right? The peers can't say, oh, the entire research, like almost the entire research on like let's say evolutionary biology and sex, human sex ratio is bad. The fact that you're working within this is, is bad. The, the paper on ovulation and voting, the peers can say, oh, you use the same measure as other people. They can't go outside and say, you said days six to 14 are peak fertility, but actually, no, it stays, it stays 10 to 17, because they're inside, right? But there's value to the inside criticism, the inside, a lot of papers, fail even peer review. A lot of papers can't even, you know, follow what's done, and, and I think that's valuable. So I think we just have to assess what is useful there. Just to answer your first question, how many of those seven million papers are politically, I probably very few. They're, I'm a political scientist, so I care about these things. As I've emphasized, it's not just political science papers. I think uh, papers on a lot of these uh, behavior papers are have heavy political content that's unacknowledged. Um, I brought up Nudge partly because they actually work for the government, right? Like so, there's these political implications. 
I don't see a particular value in reviewers writing their political stances. I think that's somewhat performative for someone to say, oh, well, I actually uh, subscribe to the Wall Street Journal. That puts me on the center right. And, um, you know, whatever. I spoke at this seminar at Stanford. And, you know, like I, I you know, like I read this sports website that's kind of pretty leftist, even though I actually read it for the sports and whatever. Like that's not, that's performative. And I don't see that as value. I, I don't really have solution at that that level. I'm just thinking more that I want to raise awareness of the issue because I think typically we talk about the replication crisis as a problem of integrity, as a systemic problem, as a problem that could be solved using institutional changes as a statistics problem. I think people don't, even in political science, we tend not to think of the political implications of the theory, and I think that's you know, that's what I want to talk about here. Okay, uh, Dan. Uh, from Zoom, yes? Hello? Do you hear Do you me? Hear you? Yes. You, you cannot hear me. Yes, can you can. Hear. You, you can. said you cannot hear me, and we said yes. Obviously, we heard you. <laughs> yes. All right, thank you. Sorry about the confusion. Um, I want to go back to, thank you, Andrew, for your talk. It's very interesting. I want to go back to Ken Schatz's first question and, and really kind of, uh, it was basically the kind of question I was going to ask, and I just wanted to add to it and maybe elicit more of a reaction from you. I went still an extensive study of the social science citation index to see if the index had an ideological bias. I was kind of struck by how um, left wing practically all journals are. And what you're talking about is statistical work. It's so you're talking about research that's vetted by reviewers and editors. And we know that professors and academics are maybe upwards of 90 percent people who favor Democrats over Republicans in the United States. I think I mean, I can only think of perhaps the JPE and the journal that you and I are both involved in as possible examples of non-left journals that publish, and I mean not just in economics, and I mean not just in the social sciences, I mean in everything, that publish statistical work. So, I mean, what would be five journals that publish statistical work that you suspect of having editors that lean, that are not lefties, that do not lean left? Can you name, I mentioned two, are there one or two more? What would they be? I'm, I'm not really up on who are the editors of social science journals. So I, I don't really know. I mean, I, I can just, I, I don't think, like, if I talk about the first example I gave, which was had a conservative perspective, the, the uh, sex ratio paper, that was published in the Journal of Theoretical Biology. I don't know who was the editor of the Journal of Theoretical Biology in 2006. My guess is that first, that more likely than not, if the person lived in the United States, that they were a Democrat, is my statistical guess. My other guess is that I doubt that the reviewer thought of this as, as political. It's possible that the editor actually, or the associate editor, thought it was political and thought, well, hey, this is a conservative take. That's good. We, maybe, we, maybe they need that. Maybe we need some balance. Like, I don't know their, their motivation. I, I'm really thinking of the content so, of the paper itself. Could you just yeah. explain briefly why you think of it as political? What, because it doesn't sound that political as a topic. Well, partly is how it was presented. So the, so the author of the paper uh, wrote a series of uh, uh, gender essentialist papers like I think he had a paper called Engineers Have More Sons, Nurses Have More Daughters. Um, he wrote a book about this. He, he like tried really hard and got himself canceled a couple times. Um, he got, his result was featured in Freakonomics as here's a politically incorrect finding for you. Um, so it was definitely presented that way. Um, that's where he, that's where the author is coming from. Um, I think that Certain forms of gender essentialism have a 
left wing take to them and some have a right wing take to them. So there is a whole literature on finding difference between the sexes and then saying, therefore, women are getting screwed, right? Like, like you find any difference um, or the minority group is getting screwed. There's definitely a kind of leftist take where as long as you find any disparity, one way or the other, you can, you can call it like um, discrimination. Uh, there is a right wing version, which is claiming that various um, disparities are natural and, and either due to biology or human nature. And such claims, just as with the claims of discrimination, are not necessarily false. Uh, it's completely fine, obviously, for left wing and right wing people to believe things that, that can be true. Uh, the problem here is with that the evidence was not, was not there. Chris in the back. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, I wanted to go back to some of the earlier positions and, and some of the conversation you had about people uh, who are experts in one field and then they start talking about another adjacent or sometimes not so adjacent field. Uh, you seem to be criticizing the inertia in some literatures in which there's a bunch of people who write about something that if we look closely at that study, it's disproven, but they are not questioning it, they're just building on that. And I, I was just wondering how much, how much do you think that's just the way that academia has to work insofar as it's a social network? So the only way to be able to publish is if you're a conversation with other people, et cetera, et cetera. We, we could change all of those no, norms. No, no, that's fine. Now, I mean, yeah. I can accept that's like the big picture. It's like, yeah, yeah they're doing stuff. And it's, it's, as, as somebody else said, look, if it's really crappy, eventually it, it fades away. Well, Astrology hasn't faded away. It's only been a few thousand years, but you know, eventually. Um, and in the meantime, like we have to accept inefficiency. That's the price we pay, right? So if the New York Times runs articles saying that UFOs are space aliens, I think that's stupid, but you know, I shouldn't stop the free press. If the New York Times never ran anything that I thought was stupid, that they would be making mistakes. I, all I'm going to say is that I think science is self-correcting, but for it to be self-correcting, it needs to actually get corrected. So somebody like us sometimes has to do that work. Like the people in this room, in the virtual room, sometimes we do have to be there complaining and saying, hey, this isn't right. Um, it won't happen by itself. And so we're playing a role. So maybe the system is fine. And maybe part of the reason it's fine is because people like us are out there screaming and mocking and you know, making a TED talk into a word of derision. Uh, you know, maybe that's just the way it is. Like, uh, that's, maybe that's how it has to go. Well, well I, I was wondering if there's an alternative system that you could imagine, because part of it is the fact that to be able to publish, you need to be in conversation with recent other literature. So we could break those norms, but they will come, that will come at a cost. I, I do, I had a conjecture, I have no idea if this makes sense, just recently had this conjecture that one, like why is there so much like really bad stuff getting published and various like, you know, Stanford professors like misstate, misstating about their research and saying, writing things that are, that I believe they know are false and, and things like that. Why is this happening? Well, I kind of have a theory that maybe it's like used to be if you wanted to exaggerate your results or, or get a reputation without doing the work it was kind of tough. Like maybe you'd pull some strings and get things published and, you know, write an influential textbook and misrepresent things. But now, like that's like social engineering, that's hard. Nowadays, you can just like make things up, you can copy images and publish it because each paper doesn't get that much scrutiny, right? And so then you can develop this reputation. And, and, and when you talk, by the way, when you said, oh yeah, well the crappy papers, people don't take them seriously. Let me tell you a story because I gave a talk once at uh, Ivy League econ department and I was, this was, like 10 years ago, I was talking about problems with the concept of unbiasedness. And some of the things here was more technical than this talk. And I mentioned a couple of studies and someone said, oh, well, that study, that was in PNAS. It wasn't in like a top five econ journal. This is a joke. Well, I'm telling you, okay, the guy who wrote this study, he is a very well-known economist. He has a titled professor at some major Midwestern economics department that you might've heard of. And his web page features this claim, it's out there. So I don't care if you people who are econometricians say, ha oh, ha, it wasn't in a top five journal, I don't take it seriously. Also there's bad stuff in top five journals. Lots of bad stuff. Also bad stuff in, yeah. 
I mean, it's fine. There should be okay. bad stuff. They can't restrict the good state. There's no filter. Well, okay, Adam, thank you very much. I think these issues you're talking about are first order and something we really need to try to solve. Uh, okay. Nice to meet you, Zoom people. <laughs>